2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verses 3 through 13. Are we ready? I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. But rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. In great endurance and troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, remove me from this place. Send your son, Jesus Christ, to uplift us to inspire us, to encourage us, but most of all, God, to challenge us, to challenge us to leave this church house stronger, wiser, and better than we came in it, God. Challenge us to call ourselves and to aspire for greater things, to not be so consumed with the troubles that are at hand, but to set our sights on you, to do what you have called us to do, to complete the good work that you have started in us. God, help us to do the right thing in everything at all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 In 1989, before, I guess probably everybody in this choir stand was born, Spike Lee wrote, produced, directed, starred in and released a popular American comedy drama entitled Do the Right Thing. The movie tells a story of racial tensions that eventually ends in tragedy on the hottest day in the summer in a Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn neighborhood. The film starred Ozzie Davis, the recently departed Ruby Dee, Spike Lee, and was the film debut of Rosie Perez and Martin Lawrence. The film garnered Spike Lee an Academy Award nomination for his original screenplay and was selected by the U.S. Library of Congress and as deemed culturally significant and was preserved by the National Film Registry. It's one of only five films to ever receive that honor in the first year that it was eligible. Problems in this movie were everywhere. Everyone is struggling, it's hot, and it was not good. Yet the movie tells us and encourages us and inspires us to do the right thing. Beloved, have you ever found yourself in a situation where the tensions were high, where stuff was bad, where people were not getting along, where situations get heated? Has it ever been hot on your job because your boss just drives you crazy or your colleagues just get on your last nerve? Hot in your home because the place that should be your sanctuary is the place where sometimes you feel the most stressed 
and the least at ease. Hot in the classroom because the teacher just doesn't understand. Wow. Or your classmates annoy you. Or sometimes have you ever just been tired? Tired of people, tired of certain places, tired of certain things, tired of this, that, and everything in between. Sometimes we find ourselves in hot and heated situations surrounded by hot-tempered people who bring out our hot-headedness. Sometimes we find ourselves in bad situations with bad people, sometimes wanting to do bad stuff. Sometimes when we are treated badly, the first thing that we want to do is treat others badly. Sometimes when we feel bad, we consciously or unconsciously work to make those very people feel just as bad as they made us feel. We say it all the time that hurt people hurt people. But let's go a step further. Sometimes when people make us hurt, when people do stuff to us, the first thing we want to do is get right back at them. The dearly departed Maya Angelou said, I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And people, if they make you feel bad, how dare you turn around and make them or anybody else feel bad. I charge you that no matter what, you should always, my brothers and sisters, do the right thing. That you should always work to make people feel better, even if they have made you feel bad. That you should do the right thing and build esteem instead of destroying it. That you should do the right thing and love folk, even if they don't like you. That you should do the right thing every day, whenever you can, wherever you are, whether they do the right thing or not, you are called to a higher ground. You have to do the right thing when you are broke and when you are not broke. You have to do the right thing when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. You have to stop making excuses for the bad behavior, the bad attitude, the bad words that you use and do the right thing because you know better. We have to say the right stuff. We have to have the right attitude. We have to use the right words in everything that we do. God has called us to do the right thing. In this particular passage of scripture, I love it because it encourages me to trust in God, my source, the universe, and no matter what I'm faced with. And no matter what I'm going through, and if you read that scripture, Paul calls the role, right? I mean, he calls out everything, uh, every possibility that could be going on. And Paul writes to the church at Corinth to encourage them to do the right thing, even in difficulties, even in frustrations, trials, and problems. In this particular passage of scripture, Paul does not proclaim that the individuals should never, uh, what Paul does is proclaim that the individuals should never go out of their way to hurt anybody else. That's why the Bible says in the third verse, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path. You see, sometimes we hurt people simply because we can. Sometimes we get back at people simply because we feel justified in it. And so, unfortunately, young folk, we don't teach the golden rule as much as we used to teach it. And and back in the day, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, would tell you to turn the other cheek. They, They would say, I don't care what anybody else does, you know better. And when you know better, you have to do better. We no longer teach that because we favor a retaliate or a get back model that if somebody does something to you, we even quote the Bible. The Bible says an eye for an eye, but Jesus came so that all might have life and have it more abundantly. And we have to stop trying to get back at folk and start trying to love them as Christ told us how to love them. 
Paul says, we don't mess with anybody else so that our stuff won't be messed up. In other words, sometimes you ought to do the right thing simply because you know it's the right thing to do. But then that ain't always easy, right? And so when it's not easy, then you can take a little more selfish approach. I'm just going to do right because I don't want that to come back on me. That at the end of the day, I know that if I hurt somebody else, it's going to come back on me. And that's why Paul says, we put no stumbling block so that our ministry will not be discredited. I'm going to give you two, two helpful hints in doing the right thing. Two, two tips. One, do not retaliate, but do forgive. Do not retaliate, but do forgive. The first lesson in doing the right thing is that it really is noble. It really is noble. But sometimes we don't feel like being noble because we're human. And because we're human, sometimes we think with our hearts. We think with our feelings. We think with the, with the pain. But the problem is, is that when you face pain, that's coming from a fearful place because fear says that that somebody hurt my feelings and the fear is that what they said is right, that other people are going to believe it, that it's going to get out there. Right. And so whenever we make decisions in fear, it always leads to more fear, more pain, more hurt. But when we make decisions in love. We understand that people hurt you because they themselves are hurting. That people say stuff about you perhaps because they are worried what folk are saying about them. That at the end of the day that you have to take the higher ground because you understand that where they are coming from is not a good place. And so we don't retaliate but we forgive. Why do we forgive? We forgive not for the other person, but we forgive so we can sleep better. But we forgive so that we don't carry that mess around with us everywhere that we go. How many of us know people that people did stuff to them 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago? Every time they see that person, their whole disposition changes. Their whole energy changes. And that foe ain't even thinking about you no more. But you going around carrying all that stuff. Forgive. Perhaps that's why the Bible charges us to love our enemies. And pray for those who persecute us. Because if I'm praying for them, I can't retaliate. If I'm praying for them, I can't use the bad words that I might otherwise use. If I'm praying for them, I, I, I can't slash their tires. If I'm praying for them, I, I can't put all their business on Facebook. If my hand is stretched to God praying for them, that is not swinging on them. And so we have to do the right thing because at the end of the day, we don't want that stuff holding us back. We don't want that stuff weighing us down. That's why Paul wrote, but rather as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Whether we're being beat down, whether we're being talked about, no matter what's going on, we act like we got some sense. I remember when I was younger, my mother who's over there, I'm going to put her out there. She, well, we would go to the store, and before we went to the store, I got the disclaimer. We're not going to buy nothing. Don't you touch nothing. Don't you ask me to buy something. Don't you act like you're going to ask me to buy something. Don't you act like you're going to touch something. And that was the disclaimer. And then she told, if you showed your behind, I'm going to show mine. <laughs> and so the disclaimer then was, going into this situation, you're going to do right. You're going to do right because you know right. And unfortunately, many of us don't do right. Why? Because we have excuses. That's the second tool. Don't make excuses. Do make a new choice. Yes. 
Don't make excuses. Paul, in verses 4 and 5 in the text, lists all the hard stuff and great endurance and troubles and hardships and distresses and beatings and imprisonments and riots and hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. He lists all the stuff that at some level many of us in this room have faced. And if you have ever faced any of the hard stuff in life, you realize that sometimes you go a little bit crazy in the process. Amen. That sometimes when faced with the hard stuff in life, it's really easy to forget what you're supposed to do. It's really easy to make excuses. How many of us know folk that when they're going through and they act behave badly. The first thing they do is talk about what all they're going through, what all the problems that they have. But that's why Paul, in the very next few passages of scripture, lists the hope verses. Purity, understanding, patience, kindness, Holy Spirit, love, power of God, righteousness. That in two verses, he lists the hard stuff. And then followed by the hope. The blessing of being a Christian is that you have hope in your hard situations. The blessing of being a child of God is that you don't have to worry like everybody else worries because at the end of the day, you know that God will help you in the middle of the lion's den. You you know that you may be in the furnace, but it will not consume you. You know that you can have a resurrection experience. Paul calls out the hard stuff, yes. then follows it with hope. In everything you face that is difficult, yes. you have simply a choice to make. I'm either going to be hurt or I'm going to be healed. I'm either going to stay in this negative place or I'm going to allow hope to pull me to a different place. I'm either going to be upset or I'm going to find the lesson in the middle of the struggle so that I can get out of this thing. And of course in Miracles, uh, the writer wrote, uh, wrote, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Too often we spend so much of our energy trying to prove to everybody else how right we are that we make ourselves miserable in the process, that we stand on our soapboxes and that we try to force other people to think like us, to act like us, to be like us. But at the end of the day, baby, at the end of the day, sometimes you have to make a new choice that I can't control anybody else but myself. And if I can control myself, I can control my actions. If I can control my actions, I can control my words. And I don't care how difficult it is, it is well with my soul. I don't care how hard it is, Jesus is still good and I'm going to be all right. Paul teaches us to focus on hope. Paul said, we got every reason to stop preaching, to stop trying to stop working, to stop ministering, to stop traveling. But instead, we're going to fight with the weapons of righteousness in our right hand and in our left. And even if you have a reason not to do the right thing, it still ain't a reason not to do the right thing. It's an excuse. Paul wrote through glory and dishonor. Bad report and good report. Genuine, yet regarded as imposters. Known, yet regarded as unknown. Dying, and yet we live on. Beaten, and yet not killed. Kipling wrote, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs. And blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when men doubt you and make allowance for their doubting too, then you will be a man, my boy. If you can do the right thing when it's hard, when you're scared, when you're tired, when you're broke, when you're bewildered, if you can be nice to people when it's difficult, If you can help somebody when you have the opportunity, if you can smile at folk that are frowning at you, 
if you don't go out of your way to wrong the folk that have wronged you, then you can do the right thing. Understand that this doesn't mean let people take advantage of you. It doesn't mean let people abuse or mistreat you. Sometimes the right thing to do is to leave people alone. Sometimes the best truth to give is I don't want to deal with this right now. Sometimes the best thing to do is stop, sit, stand still, see the salvation of God and move out of the situation. Because as humans, we should understand the bad behavior of other humans. Yeah. Why? Because for everybody, we can talk about what all wrong they've done. There are folk that can talk about all the wrong that we've done. I remember getting introduced to preach one day at one of the biggest venues I got to preach at. And boy, they got up there, I ain't never heard anybody say nothing bad about Reverend Terry. And I said, it's because you ain't asked the right people. Because there's always somebody somewhere that can tell our truth. And we spend so much time wanting to hurt other people with their truth. But the blessing is that our truth ain't out there like some other folks is. And we have to understand that at the end of the day, God has called us to do the right thing. How do we then do the right thing? How how, how do we do this every second of every day? Guess what? Every second of every day, we just got to try it. Is it going to work? Lord, no. Why? Because we're humans. But each and every day we have to consciously make a choice that I'm going to be good today. I remember you ever seen little kids, they go out to school, I was on green today, I was on this today, right? They tell you what color, they will, but then you ask what color was you on yesterday, right? But each day is a new day, it's a new opportunity to do the right thing. And adults, we have each second of every day to do the right thing. This idea of brand, what is our brand? It is the image, the essence of our total being that we project into the world. It is the quality of our mind, of our body, of our soul. It's what we say, it's how we say it, it's how we live, it's our actions, it's how we think, it's our total self. Our brand is reflected in how we handle both joy and sorrow. It's reflected in how we are on Sunday and Saturday night. It's reflected in how we are with around our friends and around our co-workers and around our families. It's reflected in each and everything that we do. But what do we do when it's hard, when people are driving us crazy, when they cussing us out, when they talking bad about us, when they are looking at us with judgment? What do we do in those moments? Maya Angelou said, You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Baby, when you go through, you got to call yourself higher. You got to be better than the folk that are looking down on you. You have to stop trying to fight fire with fire. But when fire comes, you call on the fire that can withstand anything. It's the Holy Ghost. And when you can't, the Holy Ghost can You have to rise above your problems, rise above people, rise above pain. Call yourself higher. God has called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. But you're so busy trying to get back, you don't want to get out of the darkness. The Bible says you are a royal priesthood. Why are you acting like a slave? The Bible says... That you are a chosen generation. Why are you acting like God cost you aside? The Bible says that you are the head and not the tail. That you are above and not beneath. But why do you lower yourself and lower your standards? Ruby D's character in the movie Do the Right Thing. May she rest in peace. Sat in the window of her brownstone. Crazy. Talking crazy. To everybody who walked by, she was a moral, she was a, a, a litmus, a, a moral litmus test, telling people what they should and shouldn't do, and she saw everything. Understand, my brothers and sisters, 
that however you are, however old you are, whoever you are, everybody, there is somebody watching you. That the next generation is watching how you act, what you say, what you do. And that old do as I say, not as I do, that don't work. That don't work. How many times people tell you to tell you do something? Oh, okay, but then what do you do? You, you mimic what you see. The ancestors are watching. And then when it gets hard to do the right thing, think what would my mama do if she saw what I was doing right now? What would big mama say if she heard what I said the other day? What would people do that there are people, ancestors, your favorite teacher, what would they say? What would your mentor say? What would your child say? What would your big brother say? What would sister so-and-so who sat on the back pew pass you candies and cough drops and Kleenex that smell like candy and cough drop? What would she say? Each and every one of us has someone that holds us accountable. A person who is not accountable to anyone else is a danger unto themselves, their community, their environment. And that's why sometimes all it took was a threat. I'm going to tell your mama. I'm going to tell your grandmama. And I would straighten up in a second. Young people, just because they are adults doesn't mean they always do the right thing. Sometimes it's the job of the young person to say, Mama, is that what you're supposed to be doing right now? Sometimes it's the job of the next generation to hold the current generation accountable for their actions. And you ask yourself the simple question, am I being the man, the woman that I want my child to be? Am I doing what I want my child to do? Am I setting an example of rightness or of wrongness? Unfortunately, in the church, we've gotten so politically correct and so much we don't want to offend anybody. And we don't teach right and wrong anymore. And there's just some stuff that ain't right you know it ain't right, and you know better. Let us stand all over the church today.